So good morning, everyone. My name is Gretchen Miller, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Quasi Biennial. As the chair of Quasi's board of directors, I'm excited to kick off our program today. Over the next few days, we have what promises to be an inspiring array of keynote speakers, panels, and networking opportunities to present. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words to those individuals who helped make this possible. The biennial committee consisting of Jesus Gomez and Velez, Darrell Scott and myself have worked alongside quasi executive director Jared Bales, deputy director Deanna McKay and their staff members to organize the sessions. Board members Sarah Ledford and Aditi Biscar provided additional support for a pop up talks and student mentoring event. Without the creativity and adaptability of this team, the event would not have been possible. We also have to thank our government sponsors, primarily the National Science Foundation. We appreciate their continued investments in our community. While we were saddened to have to cancel its original in-person incarnation last summer, we are pleased to bring you a modified virtual version that hopefully has the advantage of being more accessible to our broadening community. Perhaps it is then appropriate that the theme of a biennial is converging ideas and expanding approaches in the hydrologic sciences. With our theme, we wanted to recognize that the compelling problems in hydrology now require deep integration of research across a wide range of disciplines. Drawing from knowledge theories and approaches across social, biological, and physical sciences leads to richer perspectives and new insights. Only by including a diversity of views, both cultural and scientific, can we holistically address the grand challenges posed by a rapidly developing world and changing hydroclimate. This year's biennial schedule is an abbreviated version of our typical event. Each day, we will begin with a multi-speaker session, a traditional panel-style discussion today, pop-up talks tomorrow, and highlights from the work of our grant awardees on Wednesday. The second hour of each day will be devoted to our keynote speakers, each of whom delivers a lecture, and these lectures are named for preeminent earth scientists. Finally, we will close out the day on both Monday and Wednesday with a networking opportunity, which is a virtual mixer and gather. If you haven't been to one of these before, I'd encourage you to keep an open mind and stop by. Um, if you're missing that random chats that you get to have at conferences, this is a great alternative, a great antidote to that maybe professional loneliness. Um, please do note as we're going through um, these sessions that each session has its own separate link in Zoom in order to keep us organized and on time. Um, session moderators will remind you of this, um, and we also encourage you to ask questions during the sessions, and instead of using the chat feature, we'd like you to use the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom. Um, this uh, will help us keep questions organized and keep questions moving. Um, we also want you to be aware, as you can probably see up at the top, uh, that sessions are being recorded and will be shared on a YouTube channel. Near the end of each session, you should see the link to the next session's room posted in the chat. Um, and that will um, allow you to go. We're going to try to have a little bit of a break between sessions, but not much. Um, we'd also like to remind you that Quasi as an organization values respect for others, their ideas, and their cultural backgrounds. We expect participants to treat everyone with respect in their interactions, to uphold the intellectual property rights of others, and to refrain from any derogatory, abusive, or harassing language, both in sessions and in their related social media. Please reach out to myself, Jared Bales, or another member of the quasi-leadership team if you feel these guidelines have been violated. As many of you know, Quasi celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. I'd like to encourage you to check out our monthly newsletters, which have included a series of columns from past and present quasi-leadership, including, I believe, some that are present in the panel today, um, reflecting on the organization's history and achievements. Throughout our 20 years, we have continued our mission to advance water science in three ways. First, by strengthening interdisciplinary collaborations through programs such as this. Second, by providing critical infrastructure like HydroShare and our hydroinformatics tools. And third, by promoting education in water science at all levels. Addressing this last point, at its start in summer of 2001, Quasi counted 33 universities as members. We have since grown to include more than 130 members and affiliates. This year, the membership voted to expand its ranks to include educational institutions beyond those with just graduate programs. 
We recognize this as a key step to making Quasi a more inclusive and diverse organization, and we hope it opens up our rich suite of resources to an even broader audience. It also follows that for our first session today, we will have a panel discussion on the future of education in the hydrologic sciences. This panel will be hosted by Dr. Darrell Scott, an associate professor in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at Virginia Tech, where he serves as assistant department head for undergraduate studies. And with that, I will hand the floor over to Dr. Scott. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you um, across the ether sphere. Um, we're excited about the panel today. I want to tell you a little bit about how it, how it formed. Um, so about a year, well, more than a year and a half ago, we were, we were, we were, we were supposed to do this, this conference, um, and it obviously did not happen. And so back in the spring, Jesus and I started chatting about what could be done in, in Gretchen. Um, and I had a long walk with Kevin McGuire, which a lot of you know from here at Virginia Tech. Um, and we batted around some ideas. Um, and that's how some of your names of the panelists came up. Um, and we're really excited about sharing what, where we're all at and, and what we know and thinking about the next 20 years um, in, the hydro, in the hydrology field, spe specifically with education. So the intent today is not to solve the world's problems. Um, the intent today is to spark conversations, build community, um, learn from one another, and then for the younger folks in the room to do some networking. And that's what we're gonna see over the next, next three days. Um, there are some great folks on the panel. And before I introduce them, I'm just gonna tell you how we're gonna handle this, this hour long session this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, or for Dr. Selker uh, in the evening. Um, each panelist has four minutes to do their introductory remarks. And so we've, as a group, have batted around some questions and I've posed some questions to each of the individuals um, and they took those and made them their own. And that's what they're gonna talk about, this, uh, talk about next uh, in, in, with four minutes each. After that, um, we're going to have a Q&A. And so as Gretchen mentioned, there's this Q&A button on the bottom right, um, and you can add a question in there. Each of the panelists have the opportunity to ask a question or answer a question, and then we'll bring some up for conversation. So to get started, I'm going to introduce the panelists very briefly. Um, uh, so we're going to start off, the first speaker today is going to be Fred Ogden. He's the chief scientist with uh, NOAA NWS Office of Water Prediction. We will then follow up with Kinsey Hoffman, who is a principal engineer at Hazen and, Hazen and Sawyer, and she's based out of New York City. We will then have uh, Drew Guswa, who's the director of the Picker Engineering Program at Smith College in Northwestern Massachusetts. Diane Lally will then talk. She's a research advisor at Eastern Kentucky University, um, and she recently graduated from the University of Nebraska, where I spent some time several years ago. We then have Venkatesh Marwadi at Purdue University, um, and you can see he has the, the beautiful stream, river, uh, looks like a nice floodplain in the background of his picture. Uh, John Selker is going to talk next. Um, he's a professor of biological and ecological engineering at Oregon State. Um, and then we will, uh, the, the last introductory remark will be Jeff McDonald. Um, and he's at the, the Global Institute for Water Security um, in uh, University of Saskatchewan. <laughs> so with that said, um, remember, ask your questions in the Q&A, um, so we want this to be interactive as possible. And we're going to start off with Dr. Ogden for the, his introductory remarks. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Okay, great. Appreciate it. Well, I'm honored to be here today speaking with such a, an illustrious panel of people. Uh, for 20 years, I was an academic at uh, two different universities and uh, recently transitioned to work for the National uh, Weather Service at the Water National Water Center because uh, what we're trying to do is, is really interesting and, and I think groundbreaking. Uh, the 
Office of Water Prediction at the National Weather Service is growing. Uh, we're developing new approaches to revolutionize water prediction in the United States, including Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and portions of Canada and Mexico that contribute to rivers that flow into the U.S. Uh, we're working to improve the way we model the land surface, channel hydraulics, reservoirs, uh, make total water predictions in coastal zones, and, and we're actively exploring different techniques for flood inundation mapping, which is uh, kind of the the big the the two big problems that we seek to solve are flood inundation mapping and then water supply and, and drought prediction. Um, to do that, we're refactoring the national water model to improve its modularity and better engage with the research community and our federal partners. We call this the Next Generation Water Resources Modeling Framework. Uh, the Next Generation National Water Model will be based on this framework, which expires to uh, allow evidence-based model selection for forecasting purposes. The Weather Service, uh, and I say many people in the hydrology community, including myself, are guilty of using a model because we're familiar with it, not because it might be the most appropriate model to use in a particular uh, setting. To get away from that, I think will represent a, a sea change in, in our, at least the approach of the weather service. The uh, next generation framework is an open source community development. It, at the AGU, we'll be rolling it out. We'll announce the, uh, the, the, the preliminary design that we've developed in partnership with some of our other federal water prediction partners. Uh, it, it will uh, allow research hypothesis testing and run on laptops to supercomputers. Uh, collaboration between hydrologic science, computer science, and data science using widely accepted uh, standards and, and recognized standards. The, the framework really seeks to help us move out of this mode that we've been in for, I'd say, most of my career. For every time a new model is developed, it comes with a, a new data model. Uh, if we can unify data models and the description of hydrologic features, that will really help to advance things. It also, this framework will help to stop reinvention of bugs and promote the adoption of best in breed approaches. Uh, and part of that will be to minimize wheel reinvention how many times do we have to rewrite the Penman Monteith equation code? Uh, and ultimately get modelers out of their modelers out of their backyard, provide it a, a framework where it's easy to use another model. And you, you don't have to be intimately familiar with it to use it uh, as, as you do now with, with the very specialized modeling approach that we've been using. Now we hire people with specialized skills. We hire people with expert knowledge and skills in fields such as hydrologic process, physics simulation, computational hydraulics, numerical methods, data assimilation, data models, geospatial analysis, remote sensing, hydrometeorology, and appropriate conceptualizations in hydrology. Model formulations, let's say, that take advantage of geospatial data but are not physics-based. I think there's a, a lot of promise to be made in that area. We desire, uh, we'd like to see academic programs that produce graduates with good fundamental knowledge. Uh, and here's a little bit of an aside from my understanding of the literature. Since the failure of physics-based distributed parameter models to live up to their potential, and, and I would put the blame squarely on the lack of a comprehensive single theory of, of storm flow generation, uh, and the fact that mechanisms, flow paths, residence times, and the transients of dominant processes, the the problem seems insurmountable. And because of that, model development has kind of waned. Uh, we need folks to train that are trained in the fundamentals. We seek to hire folks that understand the limits of predictability, understand f fundamental physical limitations and their importance, such as current number, representative elementary volume, et cetera. Uh, graduates should understand that the uniqueness of place and parsimony are important concepts affecting predictability. Uh, just to wrap up here, across federal water agencies, uh, we're likely to, we need a new generation of workers to enter the government because there's a large percentage of the workforce that's becoming eligible to retire. Water prediction is receiving resources at the federal level in response to floods and droughts. We're seeing attrition 
of uh, past years in terms of this, that support as reversing. The National Water Center has considerable support in Congress as a place to foster federal collaboration around water as opposed to agencies competing with each other. I think that's a, a major change. And finally, I'll mention the NOAA National Weather Service Summer Innovators Program, also known as the Summer Institute, which provides an opportunity for advisors to send their most innovative and acquisitive grad students to work with the national work at the National Water Center for seven weeks. They are brought up to speed with regards to our needs and given equalizing education to bring them up to speed to work as a team and show us innovative ways to help solve some of our problems. And as a byproduct of that, the students get to learn about who we are, what we do, and their advisors also have the opportunity to get involved, which opens the door for other uh, potential collaborations in the future. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Kinsey Hoffman. Hi, everybody. My name is Kinsey. I am with Hazen and Sawyer. Uh, we are an environmental engineering consulting firm, uh, though we only do work in the realm of water. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what types of skills and background that hydrology related graduates need to be successful from the viewpoint of, um, you know, a practicing uh, consulting engineer uh, doing applied, you know, applying the the skills that we learn in school to um, pro uh, issues and problems that uh, most of our clients, which are drinking water utilities or water suppliers, um, face every day. So I'm going to talk about both technical, one technical um, focus, and then one of us, one softer skill um, that you know is no less important than the technical expertise. So from the technical perspective, you know what is so important to learn in school and, and focus on in school is um, the application of the skills that you're learning. So whether that's using certain softwares or models um, or learning different coding platforms, coding has been something that increasingly new graduates coming out of school can, can really bring to whatever agency or um, organization that they're then working for. Um, you know, that's, a, that's definitely becoming increasingly more prevalent and increasingly more used and, and, and uh, applicable to everyday problems. As we are, you know, we're li living in a data-driven world and big data sets exist everywhere and being able to be nimble and, and interpret um, data coming in from all sorts of different places uh, is, has been really, really key over the last um, decade, few years, um, increasingly more important. And then building off of that um, and linking back to uh, what Fred talked about with the National Water Model and National Water Center, when you are, for the, for the folks listening in who are either in school or right out of school, um, you, you have such a good network that's introduced in school, you you learn about different data sources, different models that um, are really just coming out cutting edge uh, at the forefront of the industry. And that's something that, um, at least in, in my practice, becomes harder to stay in touch with. You know, I'm still on a lot of newsletters from when I was in school, both undergrad and grad school, and staying in touch with the, the researchers and scientists and engineers who are um, either you know, coming out with, with these models or, or data sets, um, you can bring that to whatever organization you then uh, join. Um, and it's just, be it becomes sometimes harder to stay in touch with that as time goes on. Um, and, and the national water model is one of those examples. I mean, uh, hydrologic forecasts from the weather service is a product that we use that um, it, in, our, in our work and bring to our clients that uh, you know, really stemmed from the younger staff coming in with that knowledge and being able to use that, that those products. Um, and then the softer skill that I, you know, I'm sure uh, everyone on, on here will, will agree that communication skills are so important. Um, wherever you work, whatever you do, uh, being able to communicate complex science to a wide range of audiences for hydrologists, that's you know that's in our in our nature, right? Um, we're by nature very interdisciplinary. We touch a lot of different fields, and being able to translate 
an engineering problem to, um, you know, whether it's public facing or total internal a team of scientists and engineers, it's so, so important to be able to communicate your point, the, the issue, the solution uh, every step of the way. And so for those people listening who are, um, you know, still in school, practice presenting, practice creating slides that summarize your points, practice your technical writing, um, even if that's not always in your coursework, then take the initiative to do that on your own. Um, it's really, really key. So, and, and just to close out, I mean, the technical and the communication and, and other softer skills, they, they all work together, um, vitally important. Um, and for the audience here, you know, we, we know this, but I'm just reiterating that, you know, as inter interdisciplinary um, as we are, that's, that's just critical. Awesome, thank you, Kinsey. True. All right, thanks so much. It's uh, it's great to be here and wonderful to be part of this panel. Uh, really appreciate Kinsey and, and Fred's comments. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Picker Engineering Program at Smith College, uh, which is an undergraduate liberal arts college for women. I'm also a hydrologist who focuses on theory, plant water interactions, ecosystem services, spatial variability. Uh, so when I first started thinking about hydrology education, I was considering it in, in multiple contexts. Um, but for today's panel, I want to share my perspective as an undergraduate engineering educator. And when I think about engineering education and hydrologic education, I think about a number of challenges, uh, many of which are related to diversity and representation. And while there are some students, maybe like many of us, who are naturally curious about water, watersheds, perceptual models and theory. There's no question that there are many who are curious about a wide range of other things and for whom hydrology is a part of a larger picture, for whom an understanding of hydrology is necessary to realize engineering designs. As a teacher, I know that I sometimes fall into the trap of focusing too much on the science and not enough on the designs. And when I think of the liberal arts, my colleagues here across the liberal arts, we would never propose to study art or literature or poetry by focusing solely on academic theories. We would start with the exemplary works and by doing so, we'd see the potential of art and poetry, see the potential of these human creations. And the same can be true with engineering. Using case studies can be a way in for many students with diverse backgrounds and interests. Successful cases can highlight how the science of hydrology is integrated with economics, culture, social structures in order to achieve successful designs. One could look at the big examples, right, such as the water supplies for New York City or San Francisco, both of which are large unfiltered supplies but very different in their history and management, Hetch Hetchy in a national park and multiple landowners in the watersheds of upstate New York. But I also like to consider smaller, more manageable case studies. Uh, if we're sticking with California, maybe it's green infrastructure improvements on a complete streets program in Paso Robles, uh, or on the East Coast, the daylighting of a stream and creation of a public park that also serves as a flood detention basin in Meriden, Connecticut or internationally, Jung Yoon Kim's mud infrastructure park along the Han River in Seoul, Korea, or Joan Nassauer's work on green infrastructure in Detroit, where considering whether vegetation obscures sight lines is as important as their hydrologic function. These examples are tractable enough that students can envision themselves as part of the solution. And at the same time, they highlight the importance of collaboration among hydrologists, planners, landscape architects, citizen groups, and municipal leaders. Many students are surprised, and I find pleased, to learn that there is not one right engineering solution to water challenges, but that effective designs rely as much on fitting with the socioeconomic context as they do on the science of hydrology. And developing this career fit confidence, that is the sense that a career aligns with one's identity and values, is a way to increase the success and retention of everyone and thereby welcome more into the field of hydrology. Awesome. Thank you very much, Drew.
we now have uh, Diane that's going to give her opening remarks. Greetings, I'm Dr. Diane Lally, and I'm stationed in Eastern Kentucky University right now. And I have primarily centered my research on introductory undergraduate courses. So if students are gonna have arguably their last opportunity to learn about hydrology or water in any way uh, in an introductory hydrology course, then we need to make sure that it's as engaging and compelling as possible. So we did that through a number of ways, primarily using um, computer-based modeling simulations um, and also through using different media, forms of media, infographics. Um, students didn't write papers as much as we wanted them to make decisions about things and take on different, uh, different points of view for various um, scenarios that, that we talked about, like the Raccoon River in Iowa or the Flint, Michigan, water crisis. So any number of those could all be tied back to those water balance models, the hydrogeology challenge model that we use, um, and then also just this larger picture idea of everybody needs to understand this in, in a basic way in order to be able to make decisions because those decisions are also going to influence agriculture, economics, poverty, social justice, they're all interwoven. You can't tease out water from all of those and say in wholesale um, either disacknowledge it or just um, prove that it's more important than the others. Awesome, thank you. And then as, as we, Venkatesh is next, but if you have links that you wanna share the panelists, but as well as those in the audience, um, links related to education, we definitely encourage you to put them into the chat window and we'll be collating them to share. So, Becca Tess, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Venkatesh Mirwade. I'm a faculty in civil engineering at Purdue University, uh, and I'm really thankful to Quasi for giving me this opportunity to share this panel with the distinguished speaker. Uh, let me start by telling maybe a small story. I always tell my students. When I finished my undergraduate, I had decided that I will never become a faculty. Uh, and uh, then I got bored from private industry. And then when I was doing masters, I got excited by all the research that my advisor was doing. So then I decided, okay, this is something that I might enjoy. So I became a faculty to do research and teaching or education was not my, not my primary, not that wasn't excited exciting to me at that time. And I'm at R1 University, so we obviously pay more attention to research than education. So I become a faculty and, um, and I had my student and I was doing modeling at that time. And I told my student, okay, let's do HECRAS and do this project. And the student said, I don't know HECRAS, what do I do? And I don't teach a class on HECRAS. <laughs> So I created a tutorial for him and I said, use this tutorial and I posted that tutorial online. And every time I had a student who didn't know something, I started creating tutorials from them and posting them online. And then one, one day I was giving a talk and one person came to me and said, well, I'm using this tutorial, but I need to make some changes. So how do we do that? So that gave me an idea and we came up with this idea of, modular teaching. So how, we, how can we create modules of teaching material that people can exchange and adapt um, and use this in teaching? So that's how I got into this education. And we wrote an NSF proposal and in partnership with CERC, which stands for Science Engineering Research Center, which many of you may be familiar at Carleton College. So we have been working with them for the past 10 years and we, we have hosted a lot of uh, tutorials and units and steps at CERC. So the idea of this is that people can mix and match and use these tutorials and students can do hands-on learning by using this. And the main idea behind this was using data-driven approaches. So we teach a lot of theory and equations in class, 
And I always tell my students, when you graduate, nobody's going to ask you to solve a pain momentum equation or derive a unit hydrograph. You will be using with rainfall data, stream flow data, field data. So how do you use that data and what you have learned in your class to do a project that, that you need to do when you start working in the consulting or even doing research? So many of the material that we have developed are, we call this data-driven driven approaches to education. So how can you use data? How can you use the equations that you have learned in your class and, and, and use that together to, to learn a concept? So that's how we started uh, creating these units and steps. And we, we, we have posted all of them in public domain and thankful to Quasi they have also linked some of these on their website. And, and I do research on flood modeling and flood mapping. And we all know that we just had a big flood in Europe. Uh, and we, we hear about flooding all the time now. So hurricane season is starting. So recently, uh, we partnered with uh, UNALCO and they have a program GETSI, so using geodesy tools for societal impact. So we have also created a flood hazard module. So again, the idea is how do we bring all these uh, new things, the things that are happening in society into classroom and we, we have only limited resources. So if somebody is doing an introductory class on hydrology and they want to bring floods or other extreme events into this classroom, how can we do that? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to create these modules that students can do on their own. So the module that we have, it starts with basics of flood and hydrology, then go into how do you come up with design floods? How do you use that design flood? How do you derive that design flood? How do you use it then in a model to come up with a flood inundation map? So again, this goes back to what Fred mentioned and some of you mentioned. Students need to have the skills and knowledge of how to use what they're using in their classroom. And since we cannot teach everything as individual, how can we use these online resources and collaborative platforms to, to to, to let students know that these resources exist and may, maybe you can just incorporate that module towards the end of the semester, give them a project, do it on your own. And, and, and there are resources also on the website to, to, to assess what they have learned and what they have done. So I just want to let the, the, the audience know that that's what I do and I'll be happy to to answer your questions or give more information. So again, thank you, Scott. Awesome, thank you. John, you are up. Great. Well, I mean, this uh, platform, of course, allows us to talk about things like the flipped classroom. I'm not sure if that's working here, but we are flipping the classroom. Um, and uh, what would, you know, the, the key thing that I think I wanna talk about is, is how that, the way we teach should not look anything like it did uh, five years ago. And, and I used to say this, and then post COVID, it's really become exciting. So I'm gonna just uh, share screens for just a quick moment. Um, and um, what I wanna talk about a little bit is um, how to get away from teaching classical stuff in, the, in front of the class. And so what we do is we use things like, um, like uh, um, Zoom, uh, like uh, um, mini lectures. And so here, I'm just showing you a set of, of mini lectures. These are all organized by chapters and stuff like that, where basically you- um, well, we Grammarly have, helps make your writing but, uh, clear and concise, no matter where you are. Um, uh, um, have, you put the, the content, uh, and these are little four minute videos. You put key content in those videos, students watch them. I give them review questions. It's actually all part of a book. So you can actually, the videos are linked inside the book. And so they can just click through the, the book and, and read it and, and see, the, see the interpretation of, of, of the equations. A lot of times the equations are very dry and we wanna have the interpretation of them. Um, so that's part A. Part B, um, how do we turn what we call just in case learning? That is, you might have to predict a flood someday to just in time learning you got a flood, deal with it. And that's um, a key um, piece of taking information, really making it yours. 
groups. And we've, we've gone far too far on just in case learning. And we have to adjust in time learning. So how do we simulate that in a classroom? Well, of course, the quiz. And so what I use is what I call the two pen testing method, where basically I give out a quiz based on questions that were all published at the beginning of the class. So I know what the questions are. They get this quiz. They have 10 minutes to deal with it with one color of pens. And this is on your screen or, or otherwise. And then they have to hand in those pens and they have a new color of pen and we have completely open discussion. They get full credit for the work done in one color pen. They get half credit for the number of those, the, the part that was done collaboratively. The, in the collaborative environment, there's small groups in the classroom or online, they um, uh, have to write everything in their own hand. And so this is this kind of uh, way to turn a situation from being very abstract and kind of um, teacher driven to something where all of a sudden they're coming forward because they have to ask me questions too. So I'll just go ahead and answer the question. Oh, you know, what is the Gibbs energy? Well, here's the Gibbs energy. Why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. All of a sudden they care. And previously, of course, who could care less about the Gibbs potential? Um, and uh, in terms of PowerPoint, um, if you're using any more than 10% of it in your classrooms, give it up, okay? That is just not a compelling framework for teaching. It's just not compelling. You have to use the fact that you are a human being in front of human beings. And that's where you have this incredible opportunity to influence people. You need to, in those moments you have, focus on synthesis and discernment. In our field, it's all about how to bring diverse pieces together and how to identify which pieces we, should, we belong together. And so we need to, to get them to learn the facts on their own by little videos and by really well-written textbooks and, and la di da And then we have to give them the discernment and synthesis in, in real time. Um, the other thing I do is I don't give out homework um, that's, that's written down and you have to do it on paper. They get a box and in their box is a sponge and some capillary tubes and some sand and a pipe and some colored dye and stuff like that. And they have to do their homework and they do it together and they have no idea what's gonna happen. And they see what happens when they do the experiments. And that is a much more compelling experience than is simply writing down Darcy's law equals this and then someone will write the number down to 10 significant digits. You know, what else can, can drive us crazy besides that sort of experience? The final piece of this is, is about um, critical mass. And at Oregon State University, we really took the blue book, um, the early blue book uh, to heart. And we put together a graduate program on water resources that maintained critical mass in faculty. And we did that by convincing the administration we were real. So many universities have diffused uh, elements of hydrologic sciences across their curriculum, and they don't ever get that critical mass. And we're really um, pleased that now 20 years on, um, the same age essentially as Kwasi, the Oregon State uh, graduate program in water has been really successful with the engineering science and management and policy piece of it. So that's um, some of the things. I also want to alert people that we have two new positions getting filled. We just did a five person hire um, and uh, in water and we're doing, we have two more positions now. So uh, keep your eyes peeled and, and we're looking for lots of cool applicants and stuff like that. So thanks very much. Awesome, thank you. We're going to follow up with Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Scotty. And hi, everyone. My name is Jeff McDonald, and I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan and the Global Institute for Water Security. And I guess in terms of my thoughts on hydrological education, they were really captured in a, a video talk I gave, I think, a week ago. It's linked to the program. And uh, my pet project is uh, thinking about how we bring perceptual models in catchment hydrology into our teaching. This links to some comments I think Drew made and maybe even back to Fred's initial comment about uh, storm runoff mechanisms being almost an insurmountable challenge. And uh, I think while it's not to the exclusion of other things that we do, I think it could really help our science if we really tried to uh, bring our mental models into play and improve our model structures, make them more uh, uh, explicit. But anyway, my charge today is rather different. And uh, I was asked to give advice to postdocs and new assistant professors on how to maximize their teaching effectiveness and progress through the tenure track. And uh, this is this is challenging. I had a little book called Navigating an Academic Career that came out last year published with AGU and Wiley. And uh, I have nothing on that 
on teaching. So I, I'd look to, uh, you know, Diane or, or Drew or others on the call for their expertise in teaching. But maybe I just say a couple of things in the, in the two minutes I have remaining. And that is with my PhD students and postdocs, I think it's been helpful for them in launching their academic career to get some experience. And the way I've done that, when I was at Oregon State with John teaching in that water program, I taught a field hydrology class. I brought my team into the field to lead modules. It was hands-on. Uh, now I teach an online isotope hydrology class. My postdocs and PhD students deliver modules. And what that allows me to do is to assess their teaching, give them feedback. And if, they're able, if they stay on long enough, they might do a couple of iterations, but it lets me speak to that in my letter of reference. And I think this is an enormous leg up in terms of some actual activity. So it's about being strategic because of course, in the early stages before you're on a tenure track, for instance, uh, you know, that can consume a lot of time. So thinking about really strategic, tactical engagement with teaching. For new assistant professors, <clears throat> I think the advice is out there, you know, be, uh, be confident, but not too confident, um, be prepared, be positive, organized, clear, all those things I think many of us know about. One or two things I'd mentioned just in passing is uh, don't over-prepare. I'm teaching in a new uh, coursework master's program we have with Beijing Normal University. That teaching's all via Zoom. Uh, I'd have too many PowerPoint lectures, John, so you'll have to tell, tell me about how to uh, deal with that in a Zoom world. But um, I don't know. I find even now, 30 years on in teaching, uh, I can over-prepare too early. And when it comes time to deliver, it's almost like I'm re-preparing. So there's a real fine line, I think, between over-preparing, under-preparing, preparing too soon, uh, preparing too close, and again, I see some head nods and I think people can speak to that, but it's so difficult in early career because it can consume all available time and how to avoid that because that can really hurt your career progression. One thing that we have now, I think at most universities in the United States, Canada, even Europe, are uh, teaching resources on campus. For me, it was uh, sink or swim uh, back when I started. Now there are teaching, uh, um, help centers, if you like, on campus. I've seen at my institute, good teachers become great teachers. Uh, really poor teachers become good teachers. You can up your game no matter how, what your level is. And I've, I've seen really uh, impressive evidence there. Maybe one of the last things I'll say, I see a lot of teaching seminars and job interviews. This is uh, those making that transition perhaps from a uh, postdoc to an assistant professor. The, the kiss of death, I think, is to go too fast. So, you know, taking something to the podium, saying, slow down, and it's almost like you're teaching someone to bake, and you're in the kitchen, you've baked a loaf of bread through pandemic maybe a hundred times, someone doing it for the first time, what, you added a pinch of that? Oh yeah, you know, you're, you're almost not aware or thinking of that. It's slowing down, it's really uh, bringing students along, and I've seen that hurt uh, candidates that would otherwise be very solid teachers in that uh, teaching seminar, uh, it's really, uh, really hurt them. So uh, last, maybe I'll say is uh, teaching evaluations, pay attention to them, but don't obsess over them. And that's easier said than done, but know that you're in it for the long haul. So you get teaching evaluations, maybe you're raked over the coals, you'll improve next year, you'll get more evaluations. I think it's somehow amortizing that feedback over a longer period of time can help you see their true uh, value. And then lastly, have fun because uh, you want to really exude enthusiastic, uh, fun learning in all of this. And, and certainly John's uh, examples, you know, giving a take home exercise with a sponge and a straw is a, a great way to go. And I'll stop there, Scotty, thanks. Excellent. So this is this has already been fun. Um, I think we could stop here and we all have some things that we could do better and, and have learned from. Um, let's see, there's there's a lot of places we could go. We have the Q&A up, board up, if a reminder on the right lower right hand side. 
Um, and we have a question that came in from Sarah Ledford for Diane. Um, the question is, how do you introduce the idea of, of modeling in an intro course without scaring the students and help them understand what the parameter space and limitations are? You know, that's a great question. And we fumbled the first time, at least the first time, maybe the second time as well on how to properly do that. Uh, and we got some really great feedback from students. We were conducting uh, some interviews alongside with these modeling experiences that we had, and we got some great feedback from students. Um, you know, sometimes the model stinks and you have to pick a different model. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, but also really filling in that contextual gap. Where did the data come from? Why does this matter? Who is affected? How am I going to use it? Like all of those, those pieces that are in the background that when you're just looking at a, a model and it's giving you like numbers or a graph or something like that, that like it's not very compelling. Why would this be valuable to know? How will my life be better because of this? Well, let me tell you, stay tuned. Um, so giving them reasons to care, developing scenarios around that data, and then explicitly teaching them the steps to do in the process. We made videos for every model that we use in the course about how to operate the model, what they need to put in where to get the correct output. Um, and then we have the practice at home, come to class, work through. So using that flipped um, design that John was mentioning a moment ago, um, so that they've already kind of struggled with it at home, they get to class and they can work on it with their peers, they have us available to help them. Um, and then we ask them beefier questions during class too. So not only can you actually manipulate and use the model, but what can you then tell us about the output that you get? Excellent. Does anybody else want to jump in? John? I want to talk uh, to Jeff about, about not using PowerPoint. And, and, and Jeff and I share musical interests, we won't get into that, but who loves a song where the singer is saying how perfect they are? Really great songs, right? No, what we're looking for are confessional songs, right? We're looking for people who learn something, who were imperfect. And so when we give a lecture, it is 110% okay to make a mistake. And so that's why all my lectures, I could demonstrate it now, I do now on, on, on my pad and I just write out, I do everything real time and I write it all out and I do it in exact response to student questions. And that's from these quizzes. They have questions and we just go off on those tangents. Now it does require some mastery of the subject matter, but it is, not, it is okay to, to get stuck and say, gosh, I always forget how to do this step. Let me just think about it. What, how do I think about this? And reveal how you think and reveal that you are not perfect. So I think that, um, that PowerPoint is exactly the wrong impression of engineering. Engineering is all about getting stuck. It's all about figure, finding your way. And it's all about human beings working together. And so I think that as a professor, don't feel like you have to be perfect. That's the whole trap of, of over-preparation and PowerPoint. You should be ready. Think of your favorite, you know, um, broken heart song and be there. Okay. So I'm going to bring awesome. Jimmy Buffett into the classroom. That's what I took away from that, uh, John. And vulnerability. I think being, we're all, that's what Brene Brown talks a lot about. Thank you, Tash. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with the modeling question. So I also teach an introductory hydrology class and I do include modeling in my class. And I think if you use a public domain software, which is easy to use and install, uh, students get excited. So I use HHMS, for example. And again, what we do is every week on Friday, there is a HHMS exercise for students. So if we covered rainfall in class, how do you bring rainfall into HHMS? If you cover unit hydrograph in class, how is unit hydrograph actually used? So unit, again, just giving an example, unit hydrograph is very difficult for students to understand. They don't really get it. But when they use HHMS, they at least know how it is used and what it does. So it converts that rainfall into runoff hydrograph. So if you want to include modeling in your class, so HHMS is a good example to get started. It's easy to install. You don't need administrative access. 
So students install this on their laptop and they can practice it on their own whenever they have time. So I'll stop there. Excellent. So there was a, a question in the chat that came up um, that was directed to Drew about case studies. Where do you find case studies and how do you develop them? And are there places out in the ethersphere um, that you use? Yeah, sure. Um, and I, you know, I'll just state right off at the beginning that, you know, when I was talking about case studies, um, these, you know, I might sprinkle one or two in into a class over a whole semester. It's not, you know, that's all that there is. So there's, there's still, you know, I'm still a theory guy and a model guy. And, you know, I love doing all that stuff as well. But, um, but being able to see how the designs are realized uh, is kind of knowing where you're going. Um, is really helpful. That was that was lacking, I would say, from my education uh, when I was an undergraduate. It was, you know, fortunately, I liked the math and the physics enough that I that I stuck with it. Um, but I think sort of understanding how it all fits together is is really helpful. And you know, I mentioned sort of the the big examples. Um, we're here in Massachusetts, so you know, when I'm talking about water resources, Deer Island and the wastewater treatment plant there is another example we pull in. I mean, just. You know, unfortunately, in engineering, when people talk about case studies, it always seems to be like the things that were terrible, right? The things that failed, like those are the case studies that we draw upon. Um, and I want to bring in, you know, the positive examples, the things that the things that worked well. Um, so Hetch Hetchy, New York City water supply, Seattle water supply, uh, Sebago Lake water supply, uh, Deer Island. Um, but then for the smaller ones, which are a little more tractable, you know, I find something just as simple as Civil Engineering Magazine. You know, every every month you're getting four or five case studies in there, not all of them about water resources. But if you go over a few years, uh, you can pull in these exemplary projects. Right. There's a reason why they were highlighted uh, in that magazine and you can you can draw them out and the students see how hydrology is one piece of a much larger project. The other thing they're always surprised by is how long and how expensive the projects are. Um, so that's always sort of fun to introduce them to that that piece as well. Um, so that's where that's where I go for inspiration, but I'm sure there are, are lots of uh, places that one could look for these kinds of things. Awesome. Thank you, Kinsey. Yeah, just to build off of what what Drew said, where to find them, I would my recommendation would be use your network um, at pretty much every uh, water body facility that Drew just mentioned, either I or my colleagues have worked on. So, you know, we've got case studies and, and one of the places that we always try to talk about them is at conferences. Um, I've found that the conferences that my colleagues go to are different than the conferences that I went to or attended in school or paid attention to in school. So um, some of the more, you know, look for conferences that maybe are, are where utilities are going or, or are where, um, you know, uh, manufacturers are going. Um, you know, we, we often present that at conferences, but also, you know, use your network, call people, talk, email people, um, engage with, with um, folks that are doing this in practice. And, and, you know, we've got lots of stories to tell. Awesome, thank you. So we, we have another question that came in in, in the Q&A. Um, and so, I, so this is Nicole Gasparini. I really appreciate the emphasis on soft skills, such as communication, um, and also the idea that, that we need to think about and weave in social justice, something that scientists, at least physical scientists, sometimes have had more difficulty doing. Um, I know I've been doing it for the first time in the last three years um, that I wasn't doing prior. Um, and so she, she asks, should these concepts be taught by scientists or, we, or should we be collaborating? Um, in terms of different viewpoints and, and bringing that into the classroom. Um, and I uh, was wondering if someone wants to comment on, on this question. I, I'm happy to, to kick off the, the conversation around it. I, you know, I, I think uh, a good place to start is, is being humble and sort of recognizing where your expertise lies. Um, so I think one of the things that we can do is absolutely raise the question. That's an important thing for us to be doing. Um, but then also looking around within our institutions for who might have the expertise. And, um, 
you know, I don't think there's been a single time when I've reached out to a colleague, say, from the, the ethics program or the African studies program, and I asked them to come and, and talk about a project or, or an issue, and they haven't been willing to do so. Um, so that's been really great in my institution. There's a willingness to come in and, and speak on a subject. Um, the area where we are in Western Mass, there was uh, one of the first major dam disasters back in 1874. And so that's an ethics case that we bring up uh, in one of our classes. And fortunately, we happen to have an expert on engineering failures and engineering ethics, and, and she comes in and, and helps navigate that class. So I think it's a, I think it's a both and. I think it's important for us to be raising the issues, but then also drawing upon the expertise um, when needed. Excellent. Any other, anybody else want to talk about that? We go on to the next question. Well, I think one okay. thing is, yeah, that, um, yeah um, as a professor, um, these issues come in far beyond just the classroom. And so it, recruiting students, how you treat students and all the staff and people around you, um, I think that the example of kind of infinite respect for everybody is really the key piece here. Um, that said, um, you know, I, 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 I told a terrible joke about civil engineers once, very discriminatory, um, in my, one of my very early lectures, Kevin may remember it, um, but anyway, and I learned that you can, you can piss off a bunch of people really fast, um, and, and civil engineers are sensitive too. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one of those things is to really, is to really be mindful, just be mindful all the time about how you're treating people in the classroom and that you're making a positive learning environment. Um, and that you're calling on people equally and, and treating them all equally. And I think that's that's really the key for for maintaining a, a positive classroom experience. And you already brought up being vulnerable, right? Like, so if you make a mistake, you own it and you move forward because <laughs> we're all not perfect. Awesome. Let's see. So there's a question from Danielle Hauer. Um, she, enjoying the conversation. Um, she's interested in how as educators, uh, can we relate the uh, data collection in the field um, and bringing that into modeling, uh, both for research purposes as well as for consulting? Maybe I could speak to it briefly and look to others to, uh, to kind of fill in. So I've taught field hydrology classes since you know early days with Brian McGlynn in the mid '90s in in Syracuse, and uh, it's been a great way to build community within the graduate student group. But the tough thing is, it's always been limited to about 15 students because that's how many I can you know get snowmobiles for, or a class set of snow tubes, or just physically break into modules maybe to do, you know, lake ice one day, a snow melt module or a soil physics module in the field. So I, I put this question for the group maybe, how to increase those numbers or give tastes of some field work uh, to complement the, the modeling focus that is uh, ever increasing. So I think it's a really uh, excellent question. Some hands-on component. You know, I came through an earth science tradition, not engineering tradition as undergrad, even at the undergrad level, uh, engagement in the field is kind of going the way of the dodo in many programs. So this is, a, I think, a real challenge for us. I'd love to hear what others think. Jeff, I, this is Fred. I want to echo what you said. I think you make a really good point. You know, 40 years ago, most of the people going into these fields that involve hydrology were agrarian backgrounds or, you know, much more hands-on than they are today. You know, my experience with field work is if a grad student does field work in, in a master's or a PhD work with me, it's going to delay them by a year. It's, it takes a long time. I don't have much experience in teaching field graduate courses, but that experience is key and it's missing. And it goes back to the predictability issue, you know, to see it yourself, to, to run a rainfall simulator and see that nothing comes off, no matter how hard you rain on it, but yet you're in a flashy catchment. That kind of stuff is just mind expanding. And those are the opportunities we need. And I think quasi can help there, you know, but again, limited enrollments are a problem. 
And it, it brings, I think, a humbleness to us as hydrologists when you when you see that and realize, holy cow, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing like going to the field and having your hypothesis forcefully disproven right in front of your face. But on that point, I mean, the, the, the sad truth is that I used to teach a field hydrology class. And when I dropped it, because it was such a pain in the neck to teach, and I had other things to do, the university said nothing. They're very expensive classes to teach. Uh, and, and so that, that's what's happening. I do think, though, that uh, we have to think about how to incorporate these experiences. My little boxes are one way to do it. But I think that I'm um, doing more pounding things into the ground. And my hydrology boxes, which is for my physical hydrology class, they do pound things into the ground. They make measurements from the field. Thank you, Tash. Yeah, going to field and showing students how to collect data is expensive and logistically challenging. <laughs> it's hard to get to the field. So one thing that we have done uh, here at Purdue is uh, we, we talk to some people at USGS. So we have a gauge here near our university and USGS does go out to their field to to update the rating curve. So what we have told them, whenever you schedule something, let us know and we'll bring our students or at least let the students know. So that's something that we have done. We also have some local organizations. They organize what they call sampling blitz. So they go out in the field and collect samples. So we partner with local and state agencies and federal agencies and just give those opportunities to students to have some field experience if we cannot do that in a classroom setting. I'll add to that a little bit too. Um, I think field experiences uh, brings such a better understanding of the impact, um, whether it's a model or whether it's, you know, um, how a treatment plant is operating and, and how a certain change in chemical might affect you know, something downstream. Um, I took my field methods class from Dr. Scott, actually. And some, you know, I, I still think back to some of my field experiences in school and now in my early career. And, um, you know, you might be then writing a, a proposal for another project, or you might be um, writing a monitoring plan or something. And, and you think back to your field experience and you're like, well, we can't, we can't do that. That doesn't actually, it doesn't work that way. And when you're someone who sits at a desk all day, you don't have that experience and, and you know, that causes problems down the road that will either slow you down or cost you more money. And so you know, it's really important to get that field experience and let the puzzle pieces um, click in your mind before it becomes a problem. Yeah, so this is, this is Scotty, I completely agree. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, and, and one of the words that Jeff used was community building. And, and especially for graduate students and undergraduate students, we're all coming out of COVID. Um, we can do some of this online stuff really well, but there isn't a surrogate for face-to-face -face kind of experiences um, and ground truth thing, if you will, right? Um, with remote sensing, you still need to ground truth. And it's the same thing in our field. And I think it's something that all of us can remember as we're moving forward, um, and I, I know at my university, we're, we're being pushed, we're, the new buzzword is experiential learning, right? Um, and part of that's trying to push it to not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom and engaging um, people in the federal government, um, engaging people in consulting um, and providing experiences for our students so it becomes win-wins. And I think that's an opportunity that we all have as as part of a hydro hydrology community within quasi and other organizations to really think and be active in right because we're the ones that that can help provide experiences and direct students to those um, that are going to become more and more important as we move forward um, over the next next decade so with that said i don't see any other questions that are coming in um, I've, I, I, I've, I've personally really enjoyed the last 50 minutes. This has been awesome. Um, first, I, I want to thank every, all the panelists that came on, on uh, whether, whatever time zone you're in, whether or not you're in France doing prepping for a course or 
or in the morning time on the West Coast. Um, we really value your time um, as part of the hydrology community here, um, and it's been pretty awesome. Um, secondly, I think we've all learned some stuff. There's also a lot of ideas out there um, that we all can contribute to. So from case studies to the importance of communication to hands-on activities to get students thinking and perceptual models, right? Um, it's, it's a challenge, uh, but it's one that I think our community has been doing um, and will continue to do to make uh, the, the, the uh, best hydrologists coming out in the future and thinking about what they're gonna need. So when we think about Fred's group and all the big data that's needed to solve large, large problems, right? Um, we need from the fundamentals to the hands-on to being able to do data wrangling and communicate that. So uh, we need to get students excited, right? From the freshman students um, that Diane and Drew were talking to building inclusion and equity into the classroom. Um, it's, it's an exciting time. So I, I appreciate all of your time today. I encourage you in three minutes, there is the next session is going to be starting. Um, I think there's going to be a link in the chat if it's not already there. Um, yes, it is. And so the, the last chat is the woman lecture. Um, that's going to be starting in three minutes. Thank you for your time. Reach out to any of us with questions. I think we're all pretty open group. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.